Um, and now I have the enormous privilege of introducing our second keynote speaker, um, who is the Undersecretary of Education, James Qual. Uh, James Qual was confirmed by the United States Senate on September 14th, 2021, just late last year. Um, and in, in his role as Undersecretary, uh, Qual is the most senior political appointee in the federal government with purview over higher education. Before he became undersecretary, uh, uh, Quell was president of the Institute for College Access and Success, or TICUS, a research and advocacy nonprofit that is dedicated to affordability and equity in higher education. Uh, Quell served in the Obama administration as the deputy domestic policy advisor at the White House and de deputy undersecretary at the US Department of Education. He also served in senior roles in the US House of Representatives and the US Senate. He has taught at the University of Michigan's Ford School of Public Policy and graduated with honors from Stanford University and Harvard Law School. Please welcome Under Secretary of Education, James Qual. Good afternoon. I'm James Qual. I'm the Under Secretary here at the U.S. Department of Education. And I want to thank the Hope Center for inviting me to take part in this important annual event. Your commitment to supporting students and their basic needs has never mattered more. And I imagine that all of you listening do this work for the same reason that I do, because we believe in the promise of higher education. Our colleges and universities may have more potential than any other institution to help us live up to an American ideal. The promise that in this country, it should not matter what your zip code you live in, what race, gender, or ethnicity you are, where your family comes from, or how much money they make. If you work hard, you'll have the opportunity to succeed. The problem is that for too long, our nation has struggled to fulfill that promise for all our students, and especially from low-income backgrounds and communities of color. We know that education has the power to change lives. It can promote equitable opportunity and open up new perspectives and understanding. And we know that a college degree may, remains the surest path to long-term financial security. Just this week, Hope Center data revealed that students who went to college are less likely to live in poverty. In fact, the poverty rate among those who earn a bachelor's degree or beyond is only half the rate of those without post-secondary education. The road to success runs through our college campuses, but the pandemic hit underserved students and the institutions who serve them especially hard. Enrollment fell by more than a million people. And for students, basic needs and securities were widespread. That's something we need to make sure that everyone understands. When we talk about the problem of college costs and student debt, it's not just about the tuition, it's about all the costs of being a college student. President Biden acted decisively to confront the pandemic and the American Rescue Plan included $40 billion for higher education institutions and students. This helped them adapt to the pandemic gave students financial assistance and helped them meet basic needs. We've also made significant strides on affordability. President Biden has called for free community college and new scholarships at HBCUs and MSIs. And while those proposals have stalled in Congress, they continue to make gains around the country with new programs in New Mexico and Maine enacted in just the last couple of months. We also secured a $400 increase in the maximum Pell Grant, the largest in a decade. And President Biden has laid out a plan to double Pell Grants by 2029 within our responsible budget. Over the past 50 years, Pell has helped 81 million students, including me, attend college. And the problem is that its purchasing power has shrunk over time. In 1972, a Pell Grant covered nearly 80% of the cost of attending a four-year public college. Today, it covers only 30%. We know that investments in Pell Grants pay off. One study found that providing college freshmen with an additional $1,000 in Pell Grant funding boosted graduation rates by six percentage points. In fact, the economic mobility created by Pell generates so much new tax revenue for the government that the program pays for itself, not even counting all the lives that are changed. So we are preparing now for new reforms enacted by Congress to make Pell Grants simpler and more progressive and hopefully even more effective at equalizing college opportunity. For those who must take out student loans, we're making dramatic improvements in the student loan repayment system. Before the pandemic, a million borrowers a year defaulted on their loans and suffered terrible financial consequences like garnished wages 
and decimated credit scores. Meanwhile, even some borrowers who paid what they owed still found themselves owing even more than they borrowed. These are, there are troubling racial disparities in the program, and polls show that students are starting to wonder if college is even worth it. President Biden's pause on student loan payments and interest will save a typical borrower $5,300, but it ends on December 31st. We can't go back to the broken system that failed so many borrowers before the pandemic. So when payments resume, we wanna make sure that we have a repayment system that will prevent default, give borrowers the help that they are entitled to, and make sure that student debt doesn't sap away the opportunity that is at the heart of the college bargain. That's why we're giving borrowers trapped in default a fresh start so they can regain access to financial aid, complete their degrees, and succeed in life. That's why we're proposing a new income-driven repayment plan that will save borrowers at least $1,000 a year and, for many, cut their payments in half. That's why we're working to end interest capitalization and stop balances from snowballing. And that's why President Biden announced up to $20,000 in loan forgiveness for former Pell recipients who earn less than $125,000 a year as individuals and $10,000 for other borrowers with similar incomes. This is a really big deal. Around 20 million borrowers are eligible to have their entire loan debt wiped out. Millions more will see substantially lower balances. Lower balances means lower monthly payments. And lower monthly payments means more borrowers successfully avoiding default. Millions of borrowers will get relief automatically because we already have their income information on hand. Others will have to fill out a simple form which will be available in early October. Even before this announcement, the administration has worked hard to fix its loan forgiveness programs, which were often not reaching eligible borrowers. We've now discharged a historic $37 billion in debt for 1.7 million borrowers. This includes disabled Americans who never got the relief they were eligible for until now, students cheated by for-profit colleges who were failed by our borrower defense programs until now, borrowers who paid their loans for 25 years but never had their balances discharged until now. These are teachers, nurses, social workers, and other public servants who were denied public service loan forgiveness until we streamline the program. The waiver period ends on October 31st, so please make sure to apply and tell a friend. College affordability is an important part of the puzzle, but we also know there are many other barriers standing between students and success. Too many students, especially low income and students of color, make it to college, but they never make it to commencement day. Too many drop out because they face housing and food insecurity, difficulty affording childcare, and struggles with mental health. While traveling the country, I've heard too many heart-wrenching stories from students about how their mental health has been a barrier to completion. Earlier this year, the department advised colleges on how they can use American Rescue Plan dollars to better support students from addressing housing and food insecurity to enhancing mental health support. We also announced nearly $5 million in grants for six community colleges to develop new initiatives to address students' basic needs. And we're currently accepting applications for about eight additional institutions, but the deadline is rapidly approaching and closes on October 3rd. Ed is also continuing conversations with the U.S. Department of Agriculture on how we can best assure continued access to SNAP for college students. These supports only matter if students know about them. Findings from the HOPE Center indicate that only about a third of students who experienced basic needs and security during the pandemic accessed help on campus. More than half didn't know that campus help was available. With federal help, Montgomery College in Maryland is using funding to connect at least 1,500 underserved students to resources for food assistance, transportation, mental health, and more. In Texas, Amarillo College used rescue plan funds to expand its Student Advocacy and Research Center which connects students to services when they can encounter life barriers that may impede their success. The department is working with other federal agencies such as USDA and FCC to better reach students who might be eligible for programs like SNAP and the Affordable Connectivity Program. We've published a Dear Colleague letter to clarify how colleges can use FAFSA data to help students access basic needs support. 
I suggest that more colleges create opportunities for students to consent to have their information shared with state and local agencies that offer help, maybe even as part of your admissions process. Students are better positioned to succeed when they know they have food on the table, a safe place for their children, and a roof over their heads. That's common sense. The Biden-Harris administration is committed to bolder investments in college completion. We recently held a Raising the Bar Summit that brought together college leaders, many from community colleges, HBCUs, and other MSIs, to share what they're doing to help more underserved students make it to graduation day. On that day, Secretary Cardona announced the availability of $5 million for an evidence-based college completion fund. This grant application closes soon on October 11th. Bold investments in college completion can help more community colleges and other chronically underfunded schools invest in student success. As the Secretary noted at the summit, it's a cruel irony. The institutions that serve the most students with the most to gain from a college degree have the fewest resources to invest in student success. The institutions that top college rankings lists, on the other hand, serve far too few students of color, first-generation students, and low-income students. We in the Biden-Harris administration want to create a new culture of prestige that's defined not by how many students you exclude, but by how many lives you change. And I want to make sure that states and systems know they have a huge role to play as well. States can collect actionable data, take on historic funding inequities, and encourage coordination among colleges to address problems like transfer and dual enrollment that no single institution can solve alone. States can also make accessing benefits easier, and they can provide resources to institutions to help students navigate the array of benefits and often complicated application processes. Oregon recently created benefits navigators at their public institutions to connect students with housing, technology, and other basic needs. States can do far more to streamline access for students to benefits. These issues are hard and complicated. I know when I'm feeling overwhelmed and questioning how best to move forward, I think about the students whose stories have stuck with me. I met students at CSU Dominguez Hills where two-hour commutes to class are common. I met students at the Community College of Philadelphia who are benefiting from an innovative partnership with the local housing authority. I spoke with a Valencia College student who was struggling to afford housing but was able to get support from the school's basic needs program. He worked two jobs while finishing his credential and had five job offers already waiting for him before he finished. When the going gets tough, the stories of these students keep me going, and I'm convinced that when we invest in our students, they can not only make it to college, but persist over challenges, earn their degrees, and graduate into jobs and careers that deliver social and economic mobility. The truth is that few, if any, institutions play a greater role in building a more equitable and prosperous country than our colleges and universities do. I have to tell you that too often, policymakers imagine college students as full-time 18-year-olds from middle-class families. They might have to eat ramen for a summer, but soon they'll be holding down good jobs, and if things get too tough in the meantime, they can always call their parents. I want to thank the Hope Center and everyone listening today for doing so much to call attention to the reality of students' lives. Students see colleges as their route out of poverty, not just for them, but for their children, their younger siblings, their extended families. Many struggle to get through the week. Many don't get help from their families. In fact, they need to help their families pay their bills as well as their own college expenses. So when basic needs programs exclude college students, they exclude millions of needy Americans and they risk cutting off one of our country's best bets for helping people move on to a better life. As the Secretary recently said, in this divided nation, there is no force more unifying than education. Yet education cannot heal our communities or unify our country if more and more students are left behind. When people cannot get ahead, it only perpetuates the inequities and hurts our economic competitiveness. It also undermines faith in the system and sows distrust and division that's un-American. Together, let's build a higher education system that serves a higher purpose, one that levels a playing field in a country that can be best described by the word possibilities. Thank you.